So hello and good morning, everybody. Welcome to this online event organized by the UK Trade Policy Observatory on trade impacts post-Brexit. My name is Mattia Di Ubaldo, and I'm a research fellow at the UK TPO, as well as at the University of Sussex Business School, and I will be chairing today's discussion. At UK Trade Policy Observatory, which is a partnership between the University of Sussex and Chatham House, we undertake analysis of UK and international trade and trade policy, and we publish this research in various blogs, briefing papers, and academic articles. In addition, we also provide training for British policymakers, negotiators, and other interested parties interested in all aspects of trade. Now, to today's event. I have with me a great panel of experts whose perspectives range from the academic to policy and to the business world, and who will discuss the issue of how the implementation of the trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the EU has impacted on UK businesses. Understanding the impact of Brexit and the TCA, as we'll call it, is clearly important as there have been noticeable effects on UK-EU trade right from the start of this year. Beyond this, the difficulties relating to the Northern Ireland Protocol dominate the increasingly tense talks between the UK and the EU with the triggering of Article 16 of the Protocol on one side, that of the UK, and the potential retaliation on the side of the EU in form of a suspension of some of the TCA being clearly the unwanted outcomes looming in the background. Now this and more will be discussed today, but before we get started, I need to do the usual bit of housekeeping. So I would like to remind everyone that the event is being recorded and will be posted on the UKTPO website. We have three speakers with us today and each will provide some opening remarks, which will then be followed by discussion. So I would like to ask everyone to post their questions for discussion in the Q&A. Uh, function in Zoom, and I will then take care of passing these questions on to our panelists. All right, I guess the time has come for me to introduce the speakers. Our first speaker today will be Michael Gazirek. He is Director of the UK Trade Policy Observatory and Professor of Economics at the University of Sussex. Michael is a specialist in international trade and regional integration with a few decades of experience over which his focus has been on developing countries and more recently on Brexit and UK-EU relations. We will then hear from William Bain, Head of Trade Policy at the British Chambers of Commerce. During his career, William has been an EU and constitutional law academic, an MP for Glasgow, Glasgow Northeast, Head of FinTech and Financial Services at Inline Policy, before moving to the British Retail Consortium and then on to the British Chambers of Commerce as Head of Trade Policy. Our third speaker today is Anna Jerzewska. Anna is Director of the Trade and Borders Consultancy and an Associate Fellow of UK TPO. Anna is a custom, customs and international trade advisor with a combination of private, uh, private sector policy and academic experience. In recent years, Anna has advised the UN International Trade Center, the British Chambers of Commerce, various private sector firms and governments with therefore many years of experience in delivering practical solutions for firms engaged in international trade. Now, before getting started, I would just like to, to mention that this webinar follows a very interesting episode of Dispatches, the program of Channel 4 on the impact of Brexit on UK businesses. The episode features two of our panelists today, Anna and Michael, and I, it aired, I guess, on Monday night this week, I think it was very well done. So for those of you who'd like to watch it and clearly have an interest in this topic, you can find it on the Channel 4 website. Now, without adding much further, um, I will now give the floor to our speakers for their opening remarks. We will start with Michael, uh, who will present an analysis based on the most up-to-date data of the impact on UK exports and imports since January 2021. Michael, uh, to you. Thank you very, very much, Mattia. Um, so I'm going to share some slides. So let me just do that first. And then I'll start what I, my few remarks. I will try not to speak for too long. So can you all see my slides? Can somebody yeah. confirm? Oh, yeah. clear. Great. So ever since the TCA ever since January, as soon as the data has been coming out, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about that data and trying to assess what might have been the impacts of trade 
post Brexit or post TCA, um, which is not necessarily the same thing, but let me say post post Brexit in a loose sense for now. Um, and this is and the results that I'm going to be talking about here is very much based on some superb work undertaken with our research fellows, Johannes Ayele, Guillermo Larbalestier, and Nicolo Tamberi. So what we've been doing is examining that trade data. And what we what we wish to assess is empirically by looking at the trade flows, what has been the impact of the trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the EU on UK trade. We published a briefing paper on this on Tuesday, and there's lots more detail in that briefing paper. And we published an earlier briefing paper on earlier data a couple of months ago. What we're doing is we're looking at trade in goods, trade in services in total and by sector. And I'll be highlighting some of those results shortly. And we're also looking at the extent to which this idea of the agreement with the EU being duty free and quota free, i.e. a free trade agreement with no tariffs being, being paid, we assess how this is working out in practice. So let me start off with my first uh, picture, if you like, my first graphic, which gives you UK trade to the world by month since January 2017. And just focus on the gray upper line because that gives you goods and services for now. Okay? What you see is the first red line tells you roughly when lockdown occurs and we can see a decline in trade then. And then the second red line to the right of that gives you the initial impact um, of the TCA on trade where you immediately see this dip. And this is the exports we're talking about. But then if you look at that line as we move the months forward, we see a recovery in those exports. Similarly, if you look at imports, you see a decline at the time of lockdown, you see a dip around the time of the TCA, and some recovery, perhaps less marked since then. The other thing to note in these charts is that the overall level of trade to the right-hand side of this chart, i.e. now, is lower on average than the overall level of trade as you move, as you start on the left-hand side of the chart. So in a sense, trade appears a bit lower now than it was in previous years. And that leads me to my third slide, um, which gives you in black, what, it's the same data or almost the same data. It's, this is again, monthly trade of the UK. So on the left-hand side, I've got exports. On the right-hand side, I've got imports. And on that left-hand side where I've got exports, the line in black is the UK, and all the gray lines are different EU countries. And the whole point of this chart is to show you that UK trade now, and in comparison to earlier, on average appears lower than the trade of other countries, other EU countries. So the data suggests trade has declined. But clearly, there have been other factors at play, and I, in particular, talked mentioned this in, in my remarks a minute ago to do with, for example, COVID-19. So when people say, has trade gone up or down, has trade changed or not, you have to decide relative to what. So what we do in the briefing paper is essentially we do three different ways of doing this with increasing degrees of complexity. The first thing that we do is to compare UK trade with the EU before and after 2021. So we're looking at, for example, UK exports to the EU, and we're comparing that with UK exports to elsewhere. In this case, it's non-EU OECD countries plus the BRICS. So we're comparing, has UK, have UK exports to the EU behaved differently to UK exports to elsewhere? And that's one way of trying to control for COVID effects. Second thing we do is to complicate that a little bit more, and, don't, and we don't just look at UK trade, but we look at changes in EU exports with itself and with other countries to see you know, maybe, the, maybe exports to OECD countries by the UK changed because of some change in the OECD countries, which has got nothing to do with the UK. And that second technique that we use helps to control for that because it's also looking at EU to those OECD countries and BRICS. And finally, we use a more sophisticated statistical technique which selects the countries that most closely resembled the UK before January 2021 and see the extent to which UK performance since January has diverged from countries that prior to January, our trade closely 
a pattern of trade, changes in patterns of trade, closely followed what they did. What we find is that since January, exports to EU appear to have declined by about 14%. So there's been a negative impact on UK exports by 14%. That's a big number, by the way. A decline in exports to your main market, roughly 50% of our goods exports go to the EU, by 14% is a big drop. Interestingly, imports have gone down by 24% from the EU. Again, this is goods. And similarly, we see a reduction in services exports by 11% and imports by 37%. Let me repeat what I just said. These are not small numbers. These are big numbers. A few things to note about these numbers. The effect on exports mostly happened in January. Since then, there's been a strong rebound. In contrast, imports have been down consistently since January. So the decline in imports of goods, round about 25%, has been there pretty much in every single month. And if you'd asked people in December what they would have predicted about the impact of the TCA, most analysts probably would not have predicted this. On exports, the sectors that appear to be consistently most affected, so while there has been a recovery in aggregate, that's not true in every sector. There are sectors that see a persistent decline in exports to the EU, footwear, headgear, animal and vegetable oils, textiles and clothing, and so on. So it's a very mixed picture across sectors. Next, in order to export to the EU duty-free, after all, this is meant to be a duty-free deal, free trade deal, firms need to prove that they can meet what are called the rules of origin, i.e. that there's enough activity economic activity taking place in the UK for the good to be deemed as being originating in the UK and therefore to have duty-free access to the EU market. If you look at the data, since January, between about 26 to 32 percent of UK exports to the EU that could have entered under zero trap tariffs, i.e. goods for which the UK was given preferential access to the EU market, did not do so. So tariffs are being paid on ballpark 25% of what the UK is exporting on preferential terms to the EU. Sectors where that preference utilization rate is very low include footwear, textiles and clothing, leather and precision tools. Why is this happening? We don't know for sure, but this is likely to be either because the firms could not meet the rules of origin, and we think that's probably likely to be the case, for example, in textiles and clothing, or you could meet the rule of origin, but there's a bureaucratic hassle and cost of doing that. And if the tariff is very low, it's not worth doing it. So you don't meet the rule of origin, but you pay a one or a two percent tariff. That's also another possible outcome. Let me finish off. This is still early days. We're only you know, eight, nine months in, but there is clear evidence of a negative effect. The difference in the behavior on exports is interesting and to some extent puzzling. And I'd be very interested in other people's views on this. What our work does not yet address, but we've got ongoing work on this, is, and this goes back to my very first slides here, is the extent to which Brexit has had an overall dampening effect on UK trade. So what we're looking at here is UK trade to the EU versus to non-EU. But what about if Brexit has overall dampened UK trade? And we have ongoing work on this. And we haven't looked at the differential impact across firm types. That's much harder because we don't have the data on this. But one would expect the impact on small and medium-sized enterprises to be much bigger. Let me stop there. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, this is really, really valuable information to have while the full effects of the TCA still have to play out. Um, if I may, just before moving to the next speaker, there's a clarification question from the audience. Um, if you want to say something about the method that was used to select sort of the closest counterfactual for UK um, exports, I think it's the synthetic control um, method yeah, so the method, I mean, in a sense, you, you've kindly answered my question for me, Matthias. The method that we use is technically called the synthetic control method. So it's an econometric statistical techniques that takes data um, for a wide range of countries. And then the data selects the countries, the program selects the countries that most closely appeared to behave in their trade behavior as the UK 
prior to January, and we're using those as a control group to say, post-January, are we still behaving similarly to those or not? I think that's pretty clear. Thanks, Michael. Um, all right, so thank you very much again for your uh, introductory talk. I would now pass to William. Um, William will discuss feedback from BCC members as to how they have been affected by the TCA over the last month. Um, William, to you. Thank you, Mattia, and uh, it's a pleasure to join uh, this great panel this morning. If I can offer some perspectives from the British Chambers of Commerce Trade Confidence Survey, which we conducted in the second quarter of this year, uh, we had 2,800 respondees to this survey. And I think some of the key points from this really do tie in with the research which uh, Michael has presented and what we saw on the dispatches programme on Monday evening. So in the second quarter of this year, 27% uh, of those companies who responded had said they'd seen an increase in, in, in exports. Uh, and that was up 7% since the first quarter. So it very much, um, I think, ties in with the story that we saw a big drop off in exporting in the first couple of months of 2021, and there's been a modest recovery thereafter. Um, however, 28% of responding companies said they'd seen a decrease in export sales. Now that was down from 41% in the first quarter, but 28% at this stage of the, the trading cycle is a historically high number. And indeed, it was the most popular response uh, out of all of those available to respondees. Um, there are signs of recovery in terms of export performance. Um, so manufacturing exporters were more likely to see rising sales than exporters of services. Um, business to consumer services exporters were more likely to see a sales fall in the second quarter of this year, but it's clear that neither B2C nor B2B exporters are seeing significant sales growth. And what was clear from the field work from this survey was that the respondees were citing issues with the TCA as a major barrier to growing overseas sales. Um, the balance of manufacturers who reported increased overseas sales um, was up to 8% in positive terms in the second quarter. Uh, it was minus 9% in the first quarter of 2021. Um, while the balance of services firms reporting increases uh, rose to minus 7 from minus 26 uh, in the first quarter. Uh, so, again, some evidence of uh, a rebounding in terms of export performance, both in, in goods and services. 35% um, of manufacturing exporters um, who responded to our survey reported increased overseas sales in the second quarter. 27% reported a decrease. 39% reported no change at all. And to give a sort of flavor of the issues that respondees cited in uh, preparing their submissions for us, um, you know, the key issues I think are around uh, VAT, um, around rules of origin. On the services side, um, as the economies begin to open up, uh, we're seeing problems with labor mobility. Uh, the very tight restrictions that the TCA imposes upon what people can do uh, in the other market if they're uh, seeking to find new clients or even to provide a service to clients in country and in person in the other market. And I think around sort of VAT in particular, there are clearly some things which are a function of the UK leaving the EU VAT area. And so these are structural issues that have required a structural response by companies. So we've seen a relocation of companies in terms of some of their activities into the EU itself um, in order to uh, avoid 
um, customers having to pay uh, VAT charges at the door, uh, the point of, of delivery for the sales. And that's proven, I think, easier for larger companies to do than obviously for SMEs. Um, we also still have a structural problem in that uh, companies are required to have a fiscal intermediary in terms of VAT registration within the EU. Now, this is something that Norwegian companies uh, managed to find um, a benefit from. And the business community has been saying very much to uh, both uh, the UK government and to the European Commission, we would like a deal similar to that which Norwegian companies have. It's not going to transform the situation in terms of VAT, but it will make, uh, I think, trade better for a good many companies in the short term. Um, I think we're also seeing problems in terms of agri-food exports. And there are many business groups like ourselves who have said to the UK government that we would like there to be some form of SPS agreement. Um, it is, I think, very interesting uh, that we on SPS terms are trading with the EU on less preferential terms uh, than New Zealand is. Um, you know, we do not have even an equivalent relationship on SPS, much less uh, the kind of agreement which Norway and Switzerland has with the EU on SPS. So I think that is another huge barrier for our agri-food exporters. And the third point uh, is clearly around rules of origin. Now, I think uh, going back to what Michael said, to be seeing a sort of preference utilization rate round about 75% mark, um, that is a concern. Um, and one of the things which the British Chambers of Commerce put in our submission in terms of the budget and the comprehensive spending review recently was that the UK should set up within DIT um, a trade enforcement unit. And um, unashamedly, we very much like the way that uh, the EU has set up such a unit within DG Trade um, under the leadership of Dennis Rendonay. And of course, when Commissioner Hogan, who originally proposed this, um, you know, his focus was to drive up preference utilization rates amongst SMEs. And I think such a unit could have two purposes. One, it could assist companies to think about changes in their supply chains, which could bring their goods um, into um, qualifying goods uh, in terms of using the tariff preferences. In some areas, for example, clothing and textiles being the most uh, uh, clear of those, that is going to be much more difficult um, given the inputs uh, from there have typically come from uh, the developing world and some of the other FTAs which the UK and EU had. But the other purpose of uh, a trade enforcement unit within DIT would be to assist companies to be able to find the documentation um, where if they are able um, to prove that their goods are qualifying, um, will allow them to um, get the tariff preferences that they would be entitled to do. And this is gonna be a more severe problem, I would say after the 1st of January, when the easement on origin certification uh, expires. So I think one of the key messages that um, I would say is that Chambers of Commerce are in a unique position. We've been facilitating trade for, uh, in some cases, 140, 150 years. We are, I think, an enormous source of advice and practical help and the certificates to actually make trade happen day in and day out. And alongside, um, um, you know, the... Uh, services that uh, the UK government's brought in, I think the best advice that we could give would be um, for SMEs in particular uh, to contact the local chambers of commerce to make sure that they're getting all of the documents on origin, which will be absolutely essential uh, for their exporting activities from January. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thanks, thanks very much to you, William. I think, again, this is an extremely useful account of how the situation is developing on the ground. 
Uh, I think I also like the useful suggestion of a trade enforcement unit in the IT, which you know could be very helpful in these uncertain times. So there are already a few questions, um, also for William in the Q and A. But I think we we better move on to our third speaker before meeting with question. Also because I think the talk of William will link quite well with that of our third speaker today, Anna, who will share her insights on offering detailed advice to companies dealing with the new trading arrangements. Anna, the next 10 minutes and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And um, it's great to be here with you today. Um, yes, so my perspective uh, is, is kind of more on the ground in the first couple of months of this year. Uh, all my policy uh, work disappeared and uh, I mainly spent all of my time uh, advising companies on, on how to deal with these changes. So I think this is um, um, kind of a nice, it fits nicely with what uh, Mike and William uh, were talking about from, from the kind of high level perspective. I've recently written a paper for the UKTPO collecting these kind of stories from the ground, as you will, and what the impact has been on, on UK traders. And as you can imagine, the first few months of 2021, have been incredibly difficult for the private sector, given when the TCA was published, given when crucial guidance was published. The first few months were incredibly challenging, both for traders as well as for the logistics and customs industry. Particularly, that was the case for exporters. So UK companies exporting to the EU, given the fact that the EU introduced border formalities from day one. So companies in exporting to the EU on the 2nd of January were met with full controls, full procedures, with some easements introduced as well, but in principle, everything was, uh, was required, including rules of origin certification uh, and, other, um, and other paperwork and formalities. So that made quite a lot of, um, that was a significant change for, for many companies. And some of these new barriers to trade resulted from the TCA, the majority of them, but some of them were actually dealing problems. Some of them resulted from the initial confusion. So we've heard now so many times these stories around a different or incorrect color of a pen that was used to sign some of the paperwork and that causing the um, exports from the UK to being to, to be stopped at the EU border, and these kind of initial kind of confusion um, and and um, kind of lack of understanding what the changes meant was definitely present uh, in the first few weeks or even months. But then, you know, it became very very clear that some of these barriers have nothing to do with initial confusion, but they are actually in fact new barriers to trade, and. As a result, again, it became very clear that it now is much more difficult to export to the EU. If you're a UK company, things you know things have changed. You you can't continue to trade the way you you have in the past. Now, for UK importers, that was slightly different because of the way the UK government decided to introduce border controls in the UK, the stage implementation. So, um, one of the kind of an intentional impact was that uh, you know I had clients in the first few months um, of 2021 telling me, well, you know, you said there will be a border, you said there'll be some changes. I've just imported my goods from Germany and there was no paperwork. Of course, the fact that there was ne not necessarily uh, someone checking the paperwork on the border did not mean that there were no requirements and that there were no formalities that needed to be completed. It was just that these formalities were slightly moved in time and that companies did not necessarily understand what was required of them. And that on the import side, that was the first very clear impact was the, the, the lack of understanding and lack of awareness of what these new um, rules were. And from that, um, what, what followed from that was lack of compliance. And that's something that um, you know is one of the most significant uh, impacts of these new changes is that the compliance, the level of compliance in, is incredibly low. So, for example, we talked a second ago about uh, utilization rates of the TCA and the fact that 75% is is quite low. Well, from my perspective, working with individual companies, 
Um, I'm not entirely sure that 75% is, you know, in, in any way um, uh, accurate because so many companies simply declare that the products are originating without doing anything behind the scenes. So as um, both Michael and William uh, explained, in order to confirm that your product meets rules of origin, you need to check that it actually fulfills product specific rules of origin as well as wider rules of origin. Many companies understood that the, the TCH simply meant that they have to put that one statement, that one sentence on their invoice and everything would be fine. After all, it was advertised as a, as a tariff free deal. So um, the kind of the, 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 the work that companies needed to do behind the scene was not necessarily clear. As a result, many of the products that were exported to the EU under preference under the TCA were actually not originating in the UK based on TCA rules. They, they were imported from somewhere else and shouldn't have been. But again, it's just this initial confusion and lack of um, lack of uh, understanding and awareness. And this, you know, on the one hand, the kind of the fact that we have the stage controls or the stage introduction of border controls is incredibly helpful for companies. On the other hand, because of the fact that different procedures and different requirements will and well, were and will be introduced in, at different points in time. And the fact that these deadlines have changed so many times and have been postponed so many times has led to another impact, which is just the deadline fatigue. The fact that it's getting harder and harder to have these conversations with companies and say, look, apologies. Uh, look, you really need to be compliant. You really need to uh, prepare for the 1st of January because so many of them say, well, first of all, I'm not sure that the 1st of January deadline is going to actually happen. Uh, and then the other response is, well, we haven't been compliant in 2021 and we face no consequences. And other companies have not been compliant and yet there were no consequences. So why should we actually introduce any changes? Um, so these are the kind of two initial impacts. So the, the fact that it's more difficult to trade with the EU and the fact that there is quite a lot of confusion still uh, and, and lack of compliance. Now, the, the next universal impact that, um, that affected every single company that trades with the EU is additional cost. Whether you simply pay for the customs broker to submit your export and import declarations, or whether you actually are in one of the um, more restricted, more regulated industries, and you have to provide additional paperwork, uh, SPS requirements, so anything to do with food and plant uh, products. That is an example of a regulated industry where it's not only customs. Actually, customs is a small percentage of your costs. But whatever it is that you do, whatever, whatever industry you're in, there are additional costs if you trade with the EU. And these costs will vary very much between, uh, between companies. However, that's that's one of the most universal um, impacts of of the TCA, and with an extra cost again, the, the the impact on the company varies significantly. So you can have companies where you know the extra cost is is small and easily absorbed. This is particularly the case if you if you meet rules of origin, you don't have tariffs, and the extra costs are simply at the question of paying for a customs broker. Then. In many cases, if you have a company that's large enough and have a has a margin that's um, that can handle the, the the a small reduction, then that cost can be absorbed. Absorbed. However, in some cases that was no post not possible, and in some extreme cases, uh, that extra cost had led to companies not being able to continue trading in the way they have been trading in the past. There are also obviously some, a lot of different um, responses to these extra costs in, in, in the middle of that spectrum. So that extra cost can also be passed on either to the final consumer or somewhere along the supply chain. And that is, has probably been the most uh, frequent response. So apart from these universal impacts, so additional costs, additional difficulty, additional time, additional admin requirements, and general lack of understanding and, and, and compliance, everything else really depends on, on the company. And I think, you know, that's a very important point. And if you look at um, surveys like that, the one that William was um, presenting and, and overall data that uh, Michael presented, you know, there are some unanswered questions. 
So why are we seeing what we're seeing? And one of the kind of responses to that is because it differs so much between companies. The impact of the TCA, the impact of these new borders, really of this new border really depends on so many factors that are company specific. So, you know, the size, the industry, uh, but also really, really specific factors such as where do you get your products from, where you sell them to, and, um, you know, what what your customers are willing to, to pay for. Do you have any competition in the EU? Do you not? And and so that this is very, very individual. And if you, if you know, speaking to companies, you know, you have a company, so for example, Michael mentioned textile industry as one of the most impacted industry. And that's absolutely, you know, that, that, that's, that tends to be the case, um, especially given that textile is such an international industry and yet the rules of origin are incredibly, incredibly strict. Yet I have spoken to a company in the textile industry that said it was not impacted by Brexit at all because they simply don't export to the EU. That has never been their market, um, target market. It, they, they, they sold a little bit, but a couple of percentages, but it wasn't um, a relevant um, market. So they continue to trade the way they they, they have. They, they export to, to the US primarily, and for them, very little has changed. And yet you see other companies where um, the entire business model uh, fell apart because in most cases, this is because rules of origin, the special provision that um, prevents you from accumulating uh, origin from um, third parties, and I can go into this uh, in, in in question. So that very much that the kind of the individual perspective very much differs depending on which um, company you um, you're talking to. And then kind of finish off as a result of of this individual response to Brexit, we had a range of coping mechanisms that companies introduced to to react to, to Brexit. So uh, one of the most um, kind of common one is, is looking at different ways of trading. So finding substitutes for different um, products you import as part of your uh, supply chain to be able to meet rules of origin. So looking for substitutes for foreign um, imports uh, locally. Uh, the other one I was mentioned by William as well is uh, moving to at least part of your production or part of your operations to the EU. Uh, changing your business operating model. Um, and this is also very, very difficult to quantify and and measure, uh, partially because some of this has already started before referendum. So it's not that everything changed on the 1st of January, sorry, not before the referendum, before Brexit. Um, so it's not that, you know, the 1st of January was a clear cut-off point. Companies started preparing earlier. Um, companies have been losing um, contracts and losing deals with the EU throughout the last couple of years, and then it just gradually progressed. So it's a very difficult uh, process to measure and um, and quantify. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, very much. This is really a complementary account to that of Michael and William, no? the impact of the TCA. I think learning about the specific difficulties uh, and also the heterogeneous response and also heterogeneous compliance firms is, is indeed very, very informative. Um, I would now uh, perhaps give a chance to Michael, William, and of course, those to you, Anna, to react um, to your to your introductory remarks, uh, if you have any comments, um, and, and then we can move to the questions. Uh, there are some for each of you already. Michael, would you like to come in? Thank you. Yes, I'll be brief. I've got one comment and then a, one question each for Anna and William. I'm abusing my position as a fellow panelist to ask them a question. Um, so my comment is these, and I kind of said this before, these are early days. It's only nine months in. One of the things that I think is going to be interesting, and I don't know if there's any even casual empirical evidence on this yet, is that there's a literature out there that suggests that it, often it takes a shock for firms to respond in terms of their in, investing and becoming more productive. So one of the possibly interesting and maybe even perverse effects of Brexit might be that it might force firms to invest in order to become more competitive to deal with those additional costs. And I think that's going to be an interesting thing for us to explore in future years, but we don't yet have an answer to that. So that's my comment. My question, the first is for William, which is I'm wondering how important the changes to lay mobility are. You know, we focus on the trade effects, but I'm interested in how important the changes in trade in, in labour mobility might have been on firms. 
And my question for Anna is, you talked about non-compliance by firms. I find that absolutely fascinating. My question is, what are the consequences for firms? What are the potential consequences, stroke penalties for non-compliance? And I'll stop there. Would you like to go first? Uh, thank you, Mattia. Um, really interesting question from Michael. So in terms of what we're seeing within the UK labour market, um, there are quite extensive skill shortages across quite large swathes of the economy, everything from the care sector to hospitality, the well-known problems that we've seen with HGV drivers. But I think it is the combination in terms of particularly professional services um, of the uh, EU-wide restrictions that the TCA imposes, plus also some of the member state rules um, which create new barriers to the provision of cross-border services. Uh, so there is a, a spreadsheet which um, I think sits on the Bayes website, which has a thousand restrictions some um, at EU27 level as a result of the TCA, others um, in, in sort of distinct areas. So for example, um, auditing in, in Austria uh, becomes very difficult for UK nationals to do. And it's not just the question about having the right to work for more than 90 out of 180 days in the other market there's the issue of qualifications as well. So we're seeing in areas like law, in areas like accountancy, uh, people having to um, take qualifications in the other jurisdiction um, as a means to continue their professional activities uh, in that area. And that speaks to the lack of a mutual recognition agreement on professional qualifications within the TCA, which is another area uh, that we think that the agreement has to be improved upon in the months and years to come. Thank you very much, William. I think that is, I mean, I definitely agree with, 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 uh, with your account. Um, Anna, would you want to come back to Michael about uh, the consequences for the lack of compliance uh, for firms? Yes, absolutely. That's always a, a tricky uh, question. There has been this unspoken, unofficial, um, policy that HMRC adopted of prioritizing flows over compliance initially. Um, now, this cannot go on forever because in order to promote compliance, you have to have something to uh, promote compliance with. Um, so are there carrot or a stick? And um, with compliance, very often it is the question of, you know, what happens if you're not compliant? So I think there's, there, there will be some changes coming next year in terms of how much compliance will be enforced. We've already seen, even in this first year that was supposed to be a great period, we've already seen HMRC question companies and we've already seen HMRC go after individual companies and check whether they have been compliant with their imports. So just because you, as a company, you've not been selected doesn't mean that that's not going to happen. One important point, if you're a company, please remember that just the fact that you've got your goods into the UK does not mean that you're safe, as it were. HMRC has three years from the date of import to come back and check whether you've been compliant. And they do come back and they, they do check, increasingly so. Now, if you get picked for um, an inquiry or an audit or, or, or something like that, the penalties in the UK, the, the actual penalties are quite low but it's not the penalties you're worried about. Anyone who's been through an HMRC audit um, uh, as a company knows that penalties are the least of your worries. It's the year or two years you're going to spend providing paperwork back and forth um, and worrying about this audit and the time it's going to take and the impact on your business it's going to have. So it's really not a good situation to find you safe in, even if the, the civil um, penalties in the UK, I think that the maximum is £3,000, which is not a significant cost, but it's really not the penalty that, that's an issue. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, I think there's a couple of questions that speak to what I should ask uh, details about what you were just mentioning. Um, what, what was the role of brokers in, in uh, helping firms to comply with the rule of the TCA or just um, is utilization impacted by the approach of some of these brokers? Uh, and do you expect to see any major changes in January? 
for imports um, when basically the transition period on the, on the checks on the UK side will come to an end. So brokers, uh, that's again, uh, it's a very uh, important question because very often companies, when they have a customs broker um, or a customs agent, which is pretty much the same thing, they believe that they are compliant because they have someone doing this on their behalf. That's very much not the case. A broker simply submits um, documents on the client's behalf and the company is always still liable. Uh, this is the main, um, the main uh, entity responsible for this data. That said, a good broker, a good customs agent can point out mistakes, can ensure that all is done properly, that everything's submitted. And obviously, British Chambers of Commerce is now has now a, 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 um, a branch or an entity that acts as a customs broker, Chambers Customs, and uh, you know it's a fantastic uh, broker that uh, provides these kind of services to to companies across the UK. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, I think we we can um, maybe move to a couple of questions for Michael. Um, there's a question on what's filling the missing imports on the UK side. Is that is there some substitution sort of rest of the world, UK? Um, and uh, another question that I think was kind of related. Um, could um, sort of the um, different patterns that we see when comparing the UK to other countries be due to export import composition um, of the UK? That might be okay. a bit harder to answer on the fly, but... Yeah, those are two really, really good questions. Yeah. So the lost imports, as it were, it's a really good question. And the honest answer is we don't yet really know exactly what's going on here. It, you know, one option, as the, whoever asked the question is quite right, is that it might be that we're importing more from the rest of the world as opposed to from the EU, and there's a sort of substitution of imports. That really doesn't seem to be the case. We've looked at this, and it doesn't. that doesn't seem to be what's happening. So this is probably a combination of less demand because of higher prices and a switch into buying more domestically, is my guess, but we don't actually know, but it is a very good question. On the compositional effects, whether the trade effects are driven by the different compositional effects of UK trade vis-a-vis -vis the comparator countries, it's a good question, Tom, but actually I don't think that is the answer. And there are two reasons for that. One is, if you know, in particular when we're looking at total trade, you know, if UK trade matched closely our comparator countries prior to January, but then post January, for some reason, it's compositional effects that are driving the changes. Then why have why has the composition changed post January? You know, what's the reason that will drive that compositional change? Well, you know that then therefore suggests it's still some kind of Brexit effect. So I really don't think it's compositional. The other reason why I don't think it's compositional is you know we have run these regressions, we have done our analysis broken down by HS sections. So you're now looking at I think it's 21 or 23 categories of products you know textiles chemicals transport goods so in even when you look at you know individual categories of goods we're getting these sorts of effects in some sense that is in and of itself controlling for composition so no i don't think it's compositional but it's a good thought uh, yeah very clear answer um william um there is a question on um the um, struggle with finding couriers or forwarders. Do you do you think your members struggled with that to to move their goods during the first half of the 20, 2021? Um, yes, there there is some evidence of that because I mean the role of the courier has has changed in terms of um, you know any an e-commerce export in that. Um, uh, given the departure from the common EU VAT area, um, it means that depending on the INCO terms in which the transaction is done, um, the courier has been responsible, and this was particularly the case prior to the um, establishment of the IOSS um, system um, for certain purchases under €150. Euro. Um, the courier was responsible for collecting VAT and other payments direct from the consumer on their doorstep. And we had a huge range of problems in the first quarter in particular, where customers were rejecting the goods. Um, they were saying that they had no idea that they were having to pay um, VAT on things like transit, um, insurance costs, 
uh, unexpected costs and um, goods were left essentially stateless. Um, it was more difficult and more expensive for companies to try and bring those goods back to the UK um, via their couriers uh, than it was to leave them um, in the country of destination un undelivered. So, yes, there is some evidence, particularly in the first quarter, that this was um, still very much a serious problem. Um, but again, it's one of the structural issues about the TCA. And that's why it particularly impacts upon SMEs um, who don't have the scale to establish their own entities and operations commercially within the EU. Thanks, William. Um, I would just stay with you for another uh, couple of seconds, if you don't mind. Um, could you provide a bit more information on the trade enforcement unit that you proposed? How would that be different from uh, the Trade Remedy Authority, for instance? Well, the TRA, of course, deals with um, anti-dumping duties, countervailing measures, safeguard measures, um, you know, primarily it's um, dealing with things which affect imports. Um, so, you know, clearly this year we've had some very big decisions on steel um, that um, have affected that particular industry and manufacturing as a whole. Um, the Trade Enforcement Unit would be um, something whose purpose was to get those preference utilisation rates up. It would be to work intensively with SMEs to say, here are the ways in which you might think about reordering your supply chain, if that's possible, uh, to make sure that within the product specific rules of origin, uh, you have either UK or EU content. Um, of course, the UK, as we know in the negotiations, wanted a very expansive deal on rules of origin to allow for content from all of its FTAs and EU FTAs uh, to count as qualifying content. And the EU said that wasn't acceptable to it. Um, so I think given with the TCA as it stands, uh, that unit could work quite intensively to advise companies how, if it's possible, um, how they could reorder their supply chains. And I think it could also um, work with companies where you know their their goods uh, really are qualifying, but they have some concerns about the paperwork to get them ready to provide those origin certificates and work with chamber customs, work with uh, local chambers of commerce to get SMEs ready uh, for those origin certificates, which are going to be quite critical from uh, the first of January. And that's very clear. Quite, quite stark difference in uh, yeah, in uh, from from the TRA. Michael, do you want to come in? Um, yes, I did want to come in um, briefly on this. I think the idea of a trade enforcement unit is a really good idea. I mean, essentially, the idea behind this is try and ensure that the agreement works in practice, as opposed to just thinking about what have we signed up for, but how can we ensure that it works better in practice, both in terms of ensuring that the partners that we have signed an agreement with are fulfilling their obligations, but also in terms of helping our businesses and firms to take advantage of the agreement. So I think it is a very good idea. Related to that, annually, the US, I think it's the US ITC, publishes a report on all of its, the operation of all of its free trade agreements, detailing any issues, anything that has arisen, any problems. It's kind of a documentary evidence of how is that agreement working out in practice. And I would also strongly encourage and have encouraged DIT or the government to produce such a report on an annual basis on the operation of its free trade agreement, because that provides a documentary evidence over time where you can start to pick up how to make these agreements work better. Matia, you're, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh... Thanks, Michael. I'm just thanking you for, for, your, uh, for your comment. Um, if I may ask just a question of my own, uh, I don't know who would like to go for that. Um, there seems to be an interesting evolution of the, if you want to call it sort of Northern Ireland GB Republic of Ireland trade triangle. Um, it's yesterday's news, literally, that you know, from the CSO in Dublin, that trade between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland has increased dramatically since January. We're talking about uh, Ireland's import to Northern Ireland up by 60% since January, imports up by, sorry, exports about 
50%. So um, is this something uh, that sort of uh, signals a, a marked shift in trade patterns? So is the Republic of Ireland uh, able to replace GB uh, in trade and supply chain relations for Northern Ireland firms? Or are we talking about yeah, large percentage changes, but out of a small base perhaps, so nothing too dramatic? Uh, what's your view? I, I, any of you, if you have a view, you know. Let me take this one. Um, I'm not surprised. I mean, you know, I'm not surprised that of the direction of the effect. The magnitude, as you say, is quite large, and one needs to look at that and check the numbers. As, as you know, looking at trade numbers because of the way trade is collected, trade data is collected, one has to be quite careful. Northern Ireland, there are barriers now to trade between GB, GB to Northern Ireland. Therefore, one would expect that to some extent that might be substituted by Republic of Ireland to Northern Ireland or even EU to Northern Ireland. So in that direction, that's not necessarily surprising. In the reverse direction, I guess the argument is that, the, that Northern Ireland has stayed within the single market. So its access to the EU market relative to GB's access to the EU market is better. Its access to GB is better than the EU's access to GB. So there's that sort of dividend of potentially, probably more so for the larger Northern Irish firms, of potentially having better relative access to the EU, better relative access to GB, which might be what this data is reflecting. Well, it's indeed offering Northern Ireland firms kind of the best of both worlds, or that's what you or too 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 strong a statement. Anna. <laughs> I, I, I would call that far too strong a statement. Right. <laughs> there, there are potentially some advantages to Northern Irish firms, but I don't think they've got the best of both worlds. If I can just come in, the, the, the level of uncertainty, um, the level of debate around the protocol, this level of, you know, of uncertainty has never been good for business. Business does not enjoy uncertainty. So that's, that's definitely not the best of both worlds from that perspective. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. Um, shall we maybe have another question for William? Uh, and then maybe for our final round, we're closing in uh, to 11. William, um, will the export support service launched on 1st of October and uh, highlighted in yesterday's, yesterday's export strategy launch from the IT take the role of driving forward the use of the TCI? Um, I think it's a useful addition to um, those services which already exist in the market. Um, so, you know, for example, um, there are far more people going to their local chamber of commerce every week um, than have been using ESS so far. Um, I think it's a very useful signposting service. Um, I think it's also backed up by unit within government, which is looking at the, you know, the geographical and subject specific spread of the issues which are being raised. Um, so that can only help with, with policy making. Uh, but in terms of the sheer scale of actually making trade happen on, on the ground, um, you know, the, the Chambers of Commerce are already offering um, that and providing, um, you know, a sort of steps, step change, a scale up uh, from where ESS is, is, is heading. But we think it's a useful addition um, to services which are already out there within market. Thank you very much, William. Um, so I think we are sort of close to the end of that of this session. Um, so shall we perhaps just go back to all of our panelists for a final round, sort of a, maybe thirty second, one minute comment on what you see being the greatest challenge in the immediate future in the next few weeks, given the many deadlines and the transitional periods that are fast approaching. You want to go first, Michael? You unmuted yourself. Okay, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, I don't think I'm going to answer about the greatest challenge. I, I actually wanted to make one other final comment, which is much of our discussion, in particular in the Q&A, has been concerned with goods trade. And goods trade is easier for us to talk about. We've got better data. The barriers are more uh, horizontal, more cross-cutting. We understand those barriers better. But if you look at our evidence, if you look at the evidence that William alluded to as well, actually, services trade looks like it's had at least as big an impact, a 
permanent impact currently on exports and on imports, and we're not talking very much about this. It's harder, it's more complex. If you want to talk about services, each sector is very different. The types of barriers are very different and so on, but we shouldn't forget the importance of services. Thank you. Very, very relevant. Um, Anna, would you like to go next? As the main challenge in the next couple of weeks or months, uh, I would say it's the introduction of not even full, but more full border controls on the 1st of January. And I think if you're a company, if there are any companies listening, please make sure you understand what these changes mean. There is a lot of, um, there are a lot of changes coming up. Uh, we don't actually have any changes to origin certification. We have changes to one supporting document that is only required by some companies in some cases. Please make sure you understand what's coming. Uh, please make sure you understand how important it is to get things right the first time if customs declarations are not postponed. And please work with your broker, your advisors, your in-house team to make sure you're ready for this because it will be a significant change, uh, even though you might not see chaos and massive disruptions at the border, there will be an impact. Thank you very much, Anna. And William, final word to you. Um, I'd agree very much with Michael and Anna's comments. I mean, uh, we've seen from Michael's data uh, a huge drop off in uh, goods imports from the EU into the uh, UK. And of course, that was with um, still uh, the full border controls not being applied. I think the greatest challenge, I think, in the next few weeks is trader readiness uh, in terms of um, small EU companies. Uh, being ready to navigate the, the January and July changes, particularly on agri-food. And of course, um, we are all aware at the moment of the uncertainty around the protocol. And I think business is looking for an agreement between both sides, because the last thing that uh, I think British businesses uh, want at the moment is tariffs on, on exports um, or even um, possible suspension or loss of the preferences within the TCA altogether. Great, thanks so much. Thanks, thanks very much, William. Right, I think uh, we, we we need to bring this uh, to a close. It would be nice to keep talking, but time is you know we have overrun by four minutes already. So I think we have learned a lot today, and uh, on this constantly sort of evolving matter, which is which makes things complicated, and which will keep uh, sort of us busy. Well, continue to keep us busy for the next months for sure. Uh, for now, I'd like to thank very much again our panelists, William, uh, Anna and Michael, for a very interesting and insightful discussion. And clearly, thanks also to all of you who have attended this event. Uh, that's all for now. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye.